Hello Vinaka, good evening and namaste. You're watching Fiji Village Trade Talk. I'm Vijay Narayan. Tonight we are speaking to the Fiji Labour Party leader and former Prime Minister Mr. Mahendra Choudhury uh, and we'd like to welcome Mr. Choudhury. Uh, Mr. Choudhury, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Thank you Vijay, it's a pleasure. So before we speak to Mr. Choudhury, of course, uh, we've got uh, leaders coming in uh, to speak on issues uh, as we uh, head into the elections uh, 21 days away, when majority of the people cast their votes, uh, that's December 14th. However, as we've been saying, uh, the pre-poll uh, starts from December 5th and runs till December 9th. That's the far to reach areas, the interior parts of Vitilevu, Vanulevu, the maritime areas. For those people, there'll be selected dates and selected times for people to cast their votes. So make sure you check your schedules if you're living in areas and ensure that uh, you find out when you are voting. Of course, if you're voting on December 14th, then it would be on that day from 7.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, you can call us on 3314-766 or 7730-766 with the questions and uh, we will uh, get those questions and ask Mr. Choudhury and uh, we will also uh, be confirming to you uh, at the end of this program uh, regarding our guests and other uh, shows that are lined up uh, with 21 days to go for uh, the December 14th general elections. So Mr. Choudhury, uh, this show is about just making sure we give a background of the person we're talking to uh, who are intending to lead Fiji over the next four years, stand on uh, issues that matter to the people. What will you do? It is about accountability and allowing yourself to be held accountable. Uh, Fiji Labour Party has not made the 5% threshold to qualify for seats in Parliament under the current system in the 2014 and 2018 general elections. In 2014, FLP received 11,670 votes that was 2.35% of the votes. And in 2018, the party received 2,800 votes, 0.62%. How do you rate your chances this time? As you know, uh, Vijay, that uh, I was not uh, eligible to contest those two elections. The party had a leadership vacuum. And as a result, uh, our grassroots structures were affected. And uh, uh, because of the leadership vacuum, our supporters moved away to uh, other parties and uh, we uh, have since worked hard to bring them back. And uh, we've done an assessment. Uh, we've been working silently on this for the last couple of years and uh, we are confident that this time we will definitely make the threshold. And we'll, we're looking at winning this election, actually. Some are rating FLP and saying that your time is over, your time is up. What are your thoughts? I don't, I don't agree. That's what they said in 1999. Actually, if you look at 1999, Labour was the underdog. We didn't stand a chance. But we proved our critics wrong. And this time around, we intend to do precisely the same thing. I think uh, we stand a good chance. We're aiming for 28 seats, and that's our aim. 99 was a long time ago. A lot of things have changed. Indeed, they've changed. They've changed for the worse. We want to make this country a better country. Mr. Choudhury, you have been a victim of the 1987 and 2000 coups. How would you assess your fortunes when in government, as on both occasions, you were undemocratically removed? Yes, uh, that's history now, and uh, I think the country is poorer for that. I uh, wish that these, uh, in ex uh, did these incidents didn't take place. Every time there is a coup, there is a setback, the country goes back 10 to 15 years, and we all have to pay a price for this. And uh, in the main, it's, it's, the, it's the people, uh, the poor people who pay the price for these kind of events. Um, hopefully, uh, there won't be a repeat of it uh, and uh, there would be a smooth transition of power and uh, the government elected 
will be allowed to complete its term. Does it c come back to your mind what happened in 87 and 2000? You were, you, you were imprisoned uh, in Parliament uh, for 56 days. Yes, it does. Uh, but uh, I've uh, come over it. We uh, have to do that. We have to put it behind us and move forward. And uh, because we represent the working class, the uh, farmers, small businesses, they are our uh, voters. And there is a lot that is wrong. They are not being uh, treated fairly under this existing system. There's a lot of poverty around, joblessness. Our youths uh, don't have jobs, they're qualified, but um, they cannot find employment for which they have studied and, and qualified. And the country is in, uh, in a mess, to be quite honest. And uh, we as leaders, I feel it's our duty that uh, we must uh, come forward. We can't just keep uh, accepting all this, what's going on around this is, uh, is, not, is not right, it's not fair. We have a duty and uh, we must uh, come forward and uh, do whatever we can to put this country back on track. Mr. Chaudhry, could you have done something different when you came in in 1999? Some said the assessment was that you're too arrogant. What is your comments to people listening and watching out there? Well, that is a criticism which has been fueled by my opponents, by my detractors. But look, you look at our record of governance in 1999. In 1987, unfortunately, our first Prime Minister, Dr. Timothy Mbavandra, was given just one month. But within that one month, he did some good things, like making outpatients fees, outpatient treatment in public hospitals free. We reduced, within that one month, duty on a number of basic food items. And we had, we had a lot more to do, but we had this coup just a month later. In 1999, I was given 12 months. In 12 months, you look at our record, 9.6% economic growth. This growth came mainly from our productive sectors. It was uh, backed by strong performance of the sugar industry and tourism. And uh, people who were uh, there at that time, they who will remember that uh, we managed the government finances very well. We had a net surplus in terms of uh, government, expen uh, government expenditure. So our record was there, that record speaks for itself. And those who remember that, even today, compliment the People's Coalition Government. You will re uh, recall that it was the People's Coalition Government led by Labour. Uh, so uh, yes, we have a vision, we have ideas, we can put this country right, we must be given a chance to do that. Mr. Chaudhry, question coming in through uh, Poliasi from Nandi is asking, if Mr. Chaudhry becomes Prime Minister, will he investigate the 2000 coup and mutiny? That's 22 years ago, and uh, a lot of things which would have been done to investigate that coup, who were the people behind it, uh, uh, and uh, all, that, all that, but that didn't happen. Successive governments did not want to do that. It's rather late in the day now. But certainly, I think there should be uh, an inquiry into these two events, 1987 and, 19, and 2000. Because there are people who are behind this. It didn't happen by itself. There are people who financed it. There are people who plotted it. And uh, in the case of uh, nine, uh, 2000 coup, I think George Spade uh, was the front man, but there were others behind this. There's, there's absolutely no doubt, but nothing was done to go beyond that. It was paraded as a civilian coup. There can't be a civilian coup. Where did the guns come from? Where did the guns come from? And without guns, no, no coup can be successful. So these are questions we have, which haven't been answered. The governments which came after that coup, they wanted people to forget about it. 
They didn't want an investigation because it might have implicated them, some of them. So we never had an investigation, but I think there should be one for the sake of the country, for the sake of our people, so they get to they get to know the truth. So you will have one investigation. I'm not saying we'll have an investigation, but we may have to do that. You I mean, may, appoint, have, you yeah, may and appoint uh, a, a, a commission or some kind of a body like that, independent, to go into it and bring out the truth. And what would be the objective of that commission if it does that? What would be the final goal of that commission? I think that people are entitled to know. People are entitled to know the truth. And it's for that that, that this must be dealt with. Because people don't know the truth. Mr. Chaudhry, uh, questions have been asked why you joined the Bainimarama-led government after the 2006 coup, being a victim of coups yourself. Yes, indeed. Uh, when the, we were a party to the government of that day, as you know, it was uh, a multi-party cabinet. Multi-party cabinet, Garse and... Uh, Labour. Now, when the coup happened, at that point in time, government finances were in a critical state. Our foreign reserves were way down. And uh, after the coup, we made a statement. We condemned the coup and we said that the constitution must be protected and the constitution must remain and that there should be elections as soon as possible for a return to democracy. The coup happened in December 2006, 6th of December to be precise. In January I was approached, I was called by the then president, Dr. Josef Ailo and I was asked to, to take charge of the finance ministry to stabilize state finances. I gave it a great deal of thought and uh, I put two conditions. One was that the constitution must remain and the second was that there be elections within two years for return to democracy. These conditions were agreed and I assumed the office of the finance minister and uh, I worked hard to stabilize state finances. Within that short span, I was there only 18 months. I presented two budgets, brought about a lot of uh, changes, reforms uh, in, in public finance. And when I left, the finance, uh, public finances had been stabilized. But I took that because of the critical condition in which the finances were, and we could have ended up in a pretty bad shape had some corrective action not been taken. The Fiji Labour Party used to have support of major unions in the country. It was built on those foundations. However, unionists can no longer be involved in politics. What is your stand on this? That is undemocratic. That is a denial of their right. It is a, a violation of the uh, International Convention on Civil and Political Rights. And uh, it is not something which you can have in a democratic society. So we are opposed to it and uh, we, uh, we will reinstate the rights of the unions. So you will make changes? Uh, yes, we may have to make changes. The ch changes to the constitution also are, are uh, in, uh, we have mentioned about that in our manifesto, that, that this constitution has to be reviewed because this constitution was imposed on the people it uh, did not receive the approval of parliament. There was no consultation on this with the people. And therefore, this constitution is not the people's constitution. It was imposed by the people uh, who were in power at that time, forcibly done. And so that change must come. How soon will you review the constitution? I think it is an, I think it is an immediate uh, uh, concern. It has been our concern since uh, we've always criticized this constitution. We've had to work under it, but uh, the point is that it's not a democratic constitution. 
It uh, has been uh, severely criticized by a working group of the United Nations Human Rights Council. And we all know the, the, the problems with this constitution. You cannot have democracy under this constitution. Power is concentrated in, very, in a few hands. This constitution, if any changes are to be made, 75% of parliamentarians have to agree to the change and then it has to go to a referendum and 75% of the registered voters have to say yes to the change. Yes. Mammoth ask. Yes. How will you do that? Well, it What's has to be plan? done. Because as I said, the, the, the legitimacy of this constitution itself is a question. Is the question. Is the constitution legitimate? You can't impose something on people illegitimately. And if it's an illegitimate constitution, then its validity is in doubt. What is your stand on Itoke land, knowing that more than 90% uh, of Itoke land is in this country, cannot be sold as stated in the 2013 constitution? You've made assessments in relation to that. What is your stand? I think land is, a, is, is an issue which is very sensitive, but land ownership has never been challenged by us or by the Indian community for that matter. It is accepted that the, the ownership of the land, Aitoke land, lies with them. The issue has been the use of land and mainly for agricultural purposes. Now one has to realize, we have to go back into history on this. Our forefathers were brought here under British rule in India and British rule here. There was a need for labor, cheap labor. And uh, that was the start of Girmet. So some 65,000 of our forefathers were brought here to work the plantations, mainly in the sugarcane fields and uh, prop up the economy of Fiji. Fiji was built on the back of sugar. There's no doubt about that. Factories and uh, other things came very late in the day. Right up until 19, in the 70s, sugar was still the mainstay of the economy. So uh, the Indian community which had come during the Girmit era were farmers. And when the Girmet era ended in 1920, they were uh, given, they were, they were told that you are independent farmers now, you will have land to farm, because there was no other source of income for them. They, all they knew was farming, in farming. So they carried on farming. And agricultural land is the issue here. I think commercial land, uh, uh, commercial leases, industrial leases, residential leases are all different from agricultural leases. There is a legislation, Agricultural Land Lord and Tenants Act, this was enacted by the British and then subsequently uh, uh, improved on by the uh, uh, Mara government in 1976. And our party's position has been that uh, that legislation must remain because it offers protection to the tenants. It uh, provides for uh, stability in uh, the, to the farming community, to in agricultural leases. Now, uh, the issue is that uh, uh, the landlords think that the rental they get is not enough. The tenants say that uh, it is too much. So we've got to find the middle road. And what we are proposing is that uh, the cap that there is on the rental at the moment under the Agricultural Landlord and Tenants Act, which is 6% of the unimproved capital value of the land, that that cap be raised to 10% be raised to 10% so that landlords get more for, the, for rental and the difference between 6 and 10 be paid for by the government. 
So the farmer does not pay that 4%. It's not a burden on him. The state takes that, that, that responsibility to pay the difference. You're so watching Fiji Village uh, Street Talk. I'm VJ Narayan. We'll be back after this break. What I did in 2006 is to clean up the mess we started. When there has been Itoke leadership, everybody has been embraced. He cannot stomach the fact that he is not in government. You said that you couldn't pay out bonuses, but this shows an increase in board directors' fees. For any you, question, you are wanting to lead the country, not me. For any, I'm asking you the question again, back to corporal punishment. Right. What's your stand on it? Fiji First Buy cannot it. intervene into a personal matter. Absolutely you can for small you businesses. Can't. I was very uh, surprised when he came out with that statement that I would conduct a coup if I lose. Not Hand me. on your heart. It's him. No, you're a joke. Uh, no, yes. you are a joke. You're a joke. You're a joke. Don't bring it up. No, no, I'm going to bring it up. You were commander. But yes, Every but military officer and serviceman at the time was under your... You've forgotten you trained them. Bulubinaka, this is Fiji Village Street Talk. I'm VJ Narai. Fiji Village Trade Talk with VJ Narayan, sponsored by Salt and Pepper Home Decor, living in high quality. Watch it live on the Fiji Village Facebook page. Download the all new Fiji Village app. Get the latest news direct to your mobile. Get the latest sports updates from our scoreboards online. Navigate easily through our categories. Watch videos from Straight Talk interviews, local music videos, sports and many more. You can now easily listen to your favorite radio stations from your phone. Download the all-new Fiji Village app right now. Welcome back. This is Fiji Village Straight Talk. I'm VJ Narayan. Our guest tonight is uh, the leader of the Fiji Labour Party, Mr. Mahendra Choudhury, still on land, an issue about resources. What is your plan to upgrade villages, rural dwellers by making use of the resources? As it has been assessed that a lot of them continue to be in a poverty cycle. You talked about utilisation of land, increasing the money that goes back to the landlords. What is your plan? The plan for la <coughs> of labor is to, to invest in agriculture, more investment in agriculture, uh, develop uh, land that is the moment lying idle, assist the landowners to develop that land uh, and uh, make it available uh, for commercial agriculture. We are proposing agricultural estates and uh, the idea here is that these agricultural estates will also solve the unemployment problem and housing problem and boost agricultural production and will also boost the economies in the rural areas. How will you set up the agricultural estates? Well, let's, let's look at it. Uh, let's look at Sianganga. How was Sianganga developed, the Sianganga sugar belt in, the, in Vanwa Levu? That was done because the, it was found necessary to increase our sugar production at that point in time. We were uh, fortunate enough to be a part of the sugar protocol under the European Union. We had a fixed uh, quota, guaranteed quota. Getting and, preferential and, prices. And getting preferential prices. And the decision was then taken that uh, we must take full advantage of this uh, opportunity and in boost sugar production. So Ratu Sekam SMR at that time decided that he would uh, take a loan from the World Bank and uh, to increase the production. So land was found in Sianganga. It was cleared by the government. Farms were developed. And uh, the first year's crop was planted. Uh, there was some kind of an accommodation also, a hut-like accommodation for farmers to stay initially. They could improve on that later on. And uh, leases were granted, 30-year leases were granted. And so a start was made. Now, uh, you can't expect farmers to go clear land and uh, uh, 
do all that is necessary to make that land productive. They need to be assisted. So uh, we were taking similar sort of uh, an approach, making a similar approach that the government will acquire land, will uh, out of this land it will create uh, farms, three to five acre farms, and uh, these will be agricultural estates, there will be houses on it, basic homes, and uh, these homes will be given to uh, the, uh, the uh, farmers who move into these estates, and we're looking at moving people taking them back from urban to rural sector because at the moment we have a problem, huge problem in uh, squatter settlements. There are a lot of people there who are unemployed, who don't have opportunities. In the first instance, they came from rural areas, settled here in the hope of getting jobs and uh, making a living out of that. But here jobs are scarce and we have, we have a problem and the conditions under which they live are, not, are very squalid in terms of lack of sanitation, proper housing and other amenities and facilities. So there is opportunity here for them to move back and for our younger people also who are uh, without jobs to go back to farming. There is no reason why people who have not been able to access tertiary education or who don't have, who don't have employment uh, cannot go and, uh, into farming. There is money in farming if you, if you are prepared to work hard. A lot of people have made uh, a success out of their lives through farming. So uh, we feel that uh, Fiji is an agricultural country. We must invest in agriculture. We must revive the rural sector. We must find employment opportunities there. We must, we must build rural hubs to give them the amenities uh, which uh, they are com uh, they're looking for and they come to cities for that. We take the amenities there, there is activity going on and wherever there is activity going on, it is contributing to the economy. The feedback is coming through from uh, keen farmers from the farming communities over the past years that based on the history of what has happened with Alta leases expiring and people being let go, uh, people being asked to leave uh, their land because their leases have expired, uh, there's, uh, the security tenure has become a big issue and based on that, uh, what the farmers are doing, trying to get their children to get education and leave and basically that's the end of farming. You would have seen it. How will you attract people to come back? It will be a challenge, yes. It will be a challenge. But I think the situation now is such that there is also an opportunity there. It's better to take this opportunity and make something out of it rather than stagnating when there are lack of opportunities in the urban areas and they don't have the capacity or the, uh, or the uh, qualifications to make uh, life in the, in the urban centers successful. So there is an opportunity here, we, we, we feel that uh, if it is handled properly, people will move to the rural areas and, uh, and make a life for themselves there. You're watching Fiji Village Straight Talk. I'm Vijay Narayan. Mr. Chowdhury, government debt was estimated at around $9.1 billion or 89.4% of GDP at the end of July this year. That's according to the 2022-2023 national budget. The Minister for Economy, Ayaz said, Kayum said, in two years, the government lost about $2.8 billion in revenue during the pandemic. How will the Fiji Labour Party deal with government debt? If you are saying there's too much borrowing, what will you change? What are your targeted debt levels? Well, we've got a huge debt, there is no doubt about that. We've got to reduce this. And how are we going to reduce this? We have to reduce this by reducing our deficit. We have to learn to live within our means, which has not been happening. So uh, we will have to um, deal with that in, in that fashion. What we're doing, we've also proposed a budget with this, uh, with this manifesto. And uh, in the first year of uh, a Labour government, there will be no borrowing from abroad. It will be all local loans. Uh, to, uh, to fund the deficit, 
we think there is capacity in, in uh, local capacity, so there is no need to borrow from abroad. Uh, we have uh, uh, to reduce the level of deficit, we have to curtail unnecessary expenditure. At the moment, there is a lot of uh, savings which can be uh, achieved if we manage our expenditure better and we cut out the scams that there are. We uh, control, manage uh, the government expenditure better. So savings can result from that. And then uh, uh, by uh, producing more, consuming less, we'll be able to reduce our debt because we must cut back on un unnecessary or non-essential imports. I think that's a big problem here, that our, our uh, economy is a consumption-driven and debt-fueled economy. We've got to address that, to discourage non-essential imports and uh, produce more, as I said, revive the rural sector, produce, boost agricultural production. We've got opportunities in the IT sector. Uh, we can uh, do that, deal with that. Uh, and uh, uh, <clears throat> so well, there are ways in which uh, we can uh, reduce our debt by, by producing more, consuming less. And we have laid this down in our, our, in our manifesto. Uh, we've given how we're going to do this, and uh, there'll be <coughs> local manufacturing, IT development, film, TV, and music grants to artists in tourism sector, and uh, improving the ease of doing business. These are some of the things that uh, we uh, need to do. Make uh, credit facility available to businesses, small businesses, medium-sized businesses, even large businesses and uh, grow the private sector to uh, reduce debt because uh, manufacturing is one area. Our manufacturing sector has come down from where it was at one point in time. We don't have a policy of import substitution anymore. What is happening is that we are importing too much. We are not producing things that we can produce here and should be producing. So there is no encouragement to uh, import substitution. All these policies should be reviewed and changed to create opportunities here. Now, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, 24.1% or 208,021 people or, four, uh, or 45,744 households were living on or below the poverty line. The basic needs poverty line at that time was set at about $41 uh, per adult equivalent per week. A stand has been taken by some parties. The, poverty, the basic needs poverty line is too low and there's more people living in poverty, no doubt. Uh, not the 208,000 because that's pre-COVID. What is your stand on the poverty situation in the country? It's a very worrying situation and uh, low wages is the root cause of poverty. So, um, to, are you addressing me on basic minimum wage or...? Well, it's everything, poverty and basic needs, poverty yeah. line. If you, yeah. if you think the minimum wage or the living wage will be an answer, you can, uh, you can address that. Yes. So poverty levels have risen and uh, I think uh, this has, rural poverty has risen. There's no doubt about that and 75% of the people who are living in poverty, according to the uh, Household Income and Expenditure Survey, which was carried out in 2019, are unfortunately our Aitoki community. And uh, something has to be done to address this. And the only way we can address poverty is by creating opportunities, getting jobs, growing the economy. And where are the strengths? Where can we 
create this opportunity? In which sectors can we create opportunity? We must invest there. This has not been happening. You look at this, uh, what, what's happening in Vanwa level. Now, Vanwa level is uh, getting depopulated. There are less number of people living there today than there were 10 years ago. Most, quite a few of them have come to Viti level because of a lack of investment in Vanwa level. Neglect of infrastructure, alternative crops, and all that. So, similar situation prevails elsewhere in outer islands. We have not been looking at that. We've been concentrating too much on tourism. Fine, tourism is all right, but tourism takes care of only a certain segment of the people. There are a lot of people who are living outside the tourism belt, and they have been neglected. So, it's been investing in wrong places. Quite a bit of our investment has gone into tourism sector. All these roads that you see going to Denarau and other places, and they've cost us millions and millions. Whereas our rural roads have been neglected, our rural infrastructure has been neglected. We haven't opened up more land for uh, for farming. We haven't supported agriculture. We haven't subsidized agriculture. Everywhere else in the world, you know, in developed or developing countries, agriculture is subsidized because they they are a source of food security. Farmers feed us, and farmers must be taken care of. But this hasn't been happening. They have left, they were left to fend for themselves. In the last 16 years under the Fiji First Government, that's been happening. It's only after COVID that they suddenly woke up to the potential in agriculture and what the rural sector or the agricultural sector can do for the economy. But I'm afraid as soon as the airports open, that focus is off again. It's back to tourism <laughs> and agriculture is again being uh, sidelined. So you'll have a concrete plan for that? Yes, we, we think that uh, there are, these are the areas in which uh, we have not done enough and we are paying the price for it. And those who are watching would want to know uh, wage rates and salaries, uh, what do you have to say to them? Will you be re reassessing those? I think the wages are poor, there's no doubt about that. We, we look, look at the cost of living today, that's the biggest issue in this election cost of living. Where everywhere we go, we ask the people for their views and the, what do they want to tell us. Cost of living comes up right on top. A lot of them can't afford basic needs also on their incomes. So we've got to look at this. Uh, we cannot ignore that. A lot of people are saying, all right, the economy can't afford that. But look, uh, we've got to pay a basic wage which meets the basic needs of a family. Not doing that is not right. So uh, wages must be improved because wages haven't kept pace. Our economy is in this state because of the events that have taken place in the past. I, I, I mentioned the coups. They have set us back and they prevented the economy from growing at the pace it should have grown over the years. So we are a poorer nation because of these coups today. And as I say, the price that is being paid for these coups is by the ordinary people, the working class, the working people. And uh, we need to address that. They must be paid fairly. And uh, if wages are reasonable, salaries are reasonable, they will help the economy. They will help the businesses because that money will be spent. Uh, minimum yeah. wage rates, you, you have looked at that, you'll be making assessments on that. Some parties are talking about putting that up or maintaining the current levels. I think that there's a need to improve, the, improve on my basic minimum wage uh, and uh, certainly we'll be looking at that very seriously. At the same time, we will take a responsible attitude towards it. We know uh, uh, the economics of it. And uh, we have to uh, talk to businesses talk as to well. Businesses as well. It has to be done uh, in consultation with the stakeholders. Ronald Lal has uh, sent a question. He's asking, uh, Mr. Choudhury mentioned uh, to take loans locally. Is he referring to FNPF like other governments? Yes. There is a lot of misunderstanding about governments borrowing from FNPF. I'm talking about for government purposes, not to fund the uh, uh, 
uh, other initiatives. Now, it is the largest financial institution in Fiji, the FNPF. It's got more assets than all the banks put together in Fiji. That money has to be invested. And uh, governments have been borrowing from that over the years. As I said, it's local borrowing because uh, the banks don't have that kind of money to lend to the government to fund its deficit. This lending which takes place which helps the fund earn an income to pay the interest to the, the members of the fund. They're getting good interest, 5%, 6% interest right now, they're, they're being paid. So there's nothing wrong with governments borrowing from the fund. If they were not borrowing, this money will just lie in the commercial banks and they, they will not get the return which they, which they get from government borrowing. So it is uh, for the benefit of the members of the fund that government borrows and pays them a, an interest rate which adds to their balance in, the, uh, uh, in, their, in their accounts. Now, uh, so uh, there is local capacity and, and, and we you must use take it. care of that. Yeah. The, the current government is saying they borrowed more from overseas during the COVID period uh, because by borrowing from abroad, it also boosted foreign exchange, which is needed because of the borders being closed and tourism was down, almost non-existent during that period. What's your thoughts on that? You need foreign currency, of course, because you have to pay for imports. If, you, if we reduce our imports, uh, we will uh, need less foreign currency. But as I said, that we are a very import-prone import, import prone country and we're importing too much, so we need foreign, foreign exchange. And I think one of the reasons why they borrowed heavily was to avoid uh, devaluation of the Fiji dollar. So they parked all this borrowing uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, stabilized the... Uh, foreign reserves uh, to pay for imports. So foreign reserves are uh, at a comfortable position because of these borrowings and also because of the uh, remittances that we get. I think the remittances have been rising. Had it not been for these remittances coming in, our foreign reserves would be in problems. So it's, uh, it has helped. There are more Fiji people outside who are sending money into the country to support their families here. And that has helped also. So you believe now there's enough foreign earning, foreign exchange, and let's go local for the yes. coming year. Yes, we must to reduce. We must reduce, but borrow rate. less. Borrow less. What is your plan as far as uh, when it comes to taxes and duties? You went there a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, what are you planning to do? Have you thought of which ones will increase and which ones will decrease? At the end of the day, the government needs taxes to fund yes. its operations. Yes, uh, this is at page six of our manifesto. Uh, what we are saying is that uh, Labour will introduce a progressive income tax structure while containing $30,000 as tax threshold. We will review tax holidays and incentives to create a level playing field uh, on page six at the bottom right hand side. So we'll review tax holidays and incentives to create a level playing field. Uh, We've seen that uh, there are far too many concessions and tax holidays which are granted, particularly to foreign companies who come here to set up uh, businesses and all that. And this is so uh, in the tourism sector. Now, over the years, we have been uh, cautioned by international financial institutions to review these incentives, these concessions, these tax holidays, because they are hurting our revenue position. And so we must create a level playing field. We can support businesses and all that, but for a period of time. You can't go on supporting them, give granting incentives and uh, concessions forever, ad infinitum. So you have to review this and what we are going to do is to review tax holidays and incentives to create a level playing field because there are some industries which don't get all these things. There are other industries who get this. So we've got to create a level playing field. 
Uh, we will uh, certainly increase tax on non-essential imports because we're trying to discourage non-essential imports. Uh, and uh, standard, we'll standardize corporate tax at 20%, reinstate service turnover tax, which was taken away uh, in the last budget, uh, and we will widen the capital gains tax. At the moment, there are too many uh, exemptions in the capital gain tax. So uh, these are some of the tax reforms that uh, we are intending to do. There will, of course, be no VAT on basic food items, including baby food and uh, medicines. Uh, and uh, also the another action plan is to utilize capital markets, local capital markets, uh, for saving, the savings in lo local capital markets for investment, use local money for investment. So no personal income tax, $30,000 or less, and progressively you'll be looking at uh, restructuring, restructuring the tax, tax from there onwards. Indeed. That's uh, Mr. Chaudhry talking about taxes and duties. We'll be back after this break. Bulavinaka, I'm Vijay Narayan. As Fiji goes to the polls, we at Fiji Village are committed to bringing you fair, accurate and balanced coverage of the issues that matter. Visit the Fiji Votes 2022 section on Fiji Village for all the latest on the 2022 Fijian general elections. Download the all-new Fiji Village app right now. Welcome back. Uh, you're watching Fiji Village Street Talk. I'm Vijay Narayan. Our guest tonight, the leader of the Fiji Labour Party, Mr. Mahendra Chaudhry. Mr. Chaudhry. What is your plan regarding fee-free education, TELS or TOPPERS? Will you maintain the current programs? What will you amend and or will you remove any? We are intending to bring back the scholarships which were there before TOPPERS came on. Uh, we had uh, in the past uh, there were three different types of scholarships. There was a Fijian Affairs Board Scholarship, there was a Multi-Ethnic Ministry Scholarship and Public Service Commission Scholarship, depending on uh, where you were. And about four to five thousand students were qualified, were qualifying for these scholarships. I'm talking about uh, before the current system came in, either partial scholarship or full scholarship. Now that was taken away and substituted by TELS and TOPPERS. So TOPPERS was put at 600 full scholarship, 600 uh, students could get full scholarship. The rest had to borrow from TELS. Now the burden was shifted from the government to the students. Previously, as I said, about Three, four, five thousand students were benefiting from full or partial scholarship. Now only six hundred toppers scholarship. The rest borrow from TELS. So the burden was shifted from government to uh, students. 
we need to bring back the scholarships and also bring back uh, the affirmative action program to assist uh, students from poor families. At the moment, there is no such thing. They have to borrow. And uh, this way, a lot more students will qualify for assistance under TELS. We have also said that uh, uh, students who uh, complete their studies in time will have 50% of the TELS written off. So you'll continue with TELS, but 50% written off. Of the, written off. Students who undertake courses which are considered to be in national interest uh, will also get further uh, concessions. So, uh, all in all, what we're saying is that uh, we will reform the TELS uh, uh, structure. Also, uh, uh, the um, job opportunities. I'll, I'll get to that. Oh, the, the, the scholarships that you're talking about, will it be, again, ETOK affairs and multi-ethnic affairs? Are you, are you going down no, that I road? Think, I think we'll need, no, no. I think we'll not need... Race to, not race-based. No, not race-based. Right. Needs basis, yes. Needs basis. Yes, yes. Now, and what is... What is your message to the younger people of this country who are finishing off secondary school education, planning for tertiary education, and in search of employment opportunities. What will you do for them? Well, this is a big problem indeed. Youth unemployment is officially it's put at about 23-24%, but I think it's much higher. And uh, there are students who have been looking for jobs, qualified, degree, hold, degree holders, but have not been able to secure a job. This, this has to change. This is because we have not been creating opportunities for them. The economy is not growing uh, at the pace which will create these opportunities to absorb these people in the job market. So we need to do that. We need to uh, uh, make sure that the economy grows at the pace which is able to provide job opportunities to the people. Now, uh, we've talked on some of this. Uh, this is, again comes to the growing the pri private sector. Uh, we create opportunities through, we're proposing a, an academy of uh, arts, culture and sports. At the moment, our youngsters, a lot of them have talents which need to be developed. They're creative, they're good artists, they're good actors, they're good musicians, they're good sportsmen and women. But there is nothing to guide them, to assist them to fully develop their talents and market it on the global stage. Fiji Rugby Sevens is an example. <laughs> right. But there's nothing there in, in terms of an institution, aside from the rugby union. We need something better than that. We need to, to, to put in uh, these talents in there and then churn them out and put them on the global stage. How quickly so, will you get there? That's an immediate priority, because we've got to do this. We've got to give the youngsters the opportunity to develop their talent to their fullest potential. The other one that we're looking at is, what do you do with the, uh, with the dropouts? People who are uh, in secondary school, but are unable to enter uh, tertiary education level. We're proposing that this, they'll be absorbed by a national services scheme, which we are proposing to create, which will provide opportunity to up to 5,000 uh, young men and women to join the national service scheme. And at the same time, they'll be upskilling. They will be given jobs, uh, community service jobs uh, for 20, 25 to 30 hours a week. They'll be paid a minimum wage rate so that they have money in their pocket whilst they're upskilling, we'll take them off the streets and get them something to do. And uh, this is uh, a serious problem because young men and women who are qualified can't get jobs, are lying idle, they get into mischief. Mr. Choudhury, what is your assessment on the health sector and what specific actions you think should be taken? Health has been a problem, a long, long 
drone problem. Now, I think uh, the problems uh, are because of a lack of political will uh, to come to grips uh, with uh, uh, our health services, uh, the problems it faces, and deal with this. We are proposing uh, to involve private sector in the health to support the government system. The government system is proven inadequate. It needs uh, to be supported by private sector. We intend to build the capacity of private sector health services in the country so that people can access that. It supports the government system, and we're looking at something similar to uh, what they have in Australia, Medicare. We'll uh, commission a study on that. We wish to create a health insurance scheme, uh, which uh, will uh, uh, enable of people to go to private practice, practice. So you don't have to go to the hospitals. It's a similar system uh, in Australia. I think a lot of our people uh, who are living there uh, it, uh, are very happy with this kind of a system. And uh, we think that we need to look at it, think outside the box, bring in something new, innovative, which will take care of this. Of course, uh, there is a cost to it, and we'll see how best, best that cost can be met. There will be full, uh, there will be government funding from the budget, and anything, anything additional over and above that, we'll see how is how best it can be uh, met without hurting the poor. Mr. Chaudhry, question coming in in relation to people who took out their own FNPF money during COVID-19. Hmm. What will you do? We will reimburse that money. We are the first party which said that we will uh, fight to have this money reimbursed to their accounts, and if they we uh, get into government, we will reimburse uh, that money. I think it's $180 million uh, for some 164,000 uh, uh, provident fund members. Not only that, in 2012, the Fiji First government forcibly imposed reforms. They scrapped the provident fund legislation, brought in a new act, remove the workers' representatives from the boards of FNPF, will bring back the tripartite structure uh, of governance in the FNPF, and we will uh, reinstate the 15% pension rate, which was reduced arbitrarily in 2012 to 8%, cutting the pension to half. These injustices have been imposed on our pensioners, on the working population, because if you retire, you'll retire with 8%. And that is very inadequate for people with ordinary incomes. It doesn't give them a living pension. So we will revisit those reforms, reverse them, so that people can retire with a decent pension and they get justice. Mr. Chaudhry, Shonal Varisha has sent a question asking um, on a housing loan scheme where first home buyers get fifteen to $30,000 from the government as a support, uh, social welfare schemes, the pensions, the a bus fare uh, subsidy that's been given, will you continue with that? What's your plan? Bus fare, bus fare subsidy, of course, for the elderly and uh, was started by the Labour Party. TELS was started by the Labour Party, but we called it Students' Loans Scheme, those who could not access it. It was a Labour Party policy. Uh, but, of course, it, it's, been, it's been implemented differently. Uh, we will continue with the existing uh, benefits in the education sector, free bus fares, fee free education uh, to, sec sec to secondary level. And I've already told about the social tertiary, welfare pension. Social welfare pension, we propose to increase it from 100 to $200 a month. So $200, $200 a, month a month for yes, the elderly. Elderly. And, uh, and the um, physically challenged, the, all those, over, there are th three categories there. We will standardize these, they get different rates. Some get 100, some get 90, and so it will standardize their $200 a month. Mr. Chaudhry, you have been branded as an Indian party by the Prime Minister at uh, rallies, and uh, he also says FLP is supporting the return of the Great Council of Chiefs. What is your stand? We are not an Indian party. We never were an Indian party since 1987. And uh, He's probably forgotten that Labour formed government twice. Now, if we were purely an Indian party, you would have never been able to form a government. With the support of the Ethiopian community and other communities, that enabled us to, for, to uh, be in government twice. So he's completely wrong when he, when he brands us as an Indian party. 
it shows that uh, he's really not uh, up to it or rather he talks about uh, we are all equal citizens he doesn't believe in race and all that but then when it suits him he he brands people differently now uh, uh, we are not an indian part so uh, what was the other if you bringing back the great council, great council of, chiefs. of chiefs we haven't made a statement on that i don't know where he got this from but what we said we have a petition on that that look the great council of chiefs was very unceremoniously removed by the prime minister without consultation and uh, with the people didn't even ask anybody he decided suddenly that they must go and uh, they he, he was even abusive about them saying that they should go and drink home brew under a banana tree or something like that mango tree. he was he, mango tree he, 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 he was very insulting to them but when it suits him he goes and begs the chiefs for their for their support and votes now in terms of uh, traditional practices cultural practices and all that in any community if changes are to be made they should be made in consultation with the people the call for change must come from the people themselves it is not for the government to impose these changes on them without due consultation there is our position so you'll go back to the people if they want it, it's a people. great council let, of let chiefs the people say they don't want great council of chiefs they should uh, consult the people and and listen to the people if they want it let them have it it is uh, after all an uh, an institution uh, which has uh, provided stability in difficult times and all that and uh, i think it's uh, cherished by uh, the ethiopia okay community so let them decide whether they want it to continue or they don't want it mr choudhry what's your stand on civil servants pay contracts retirement age and conditions we will bring about the changes because we'll we'll put civil service back to where it was in terms of permanent employment we'll remove the uh, uh individual em- co- employment contracts and uh we'll restore the retirement age to 60 uh, we will uh award pay increases to them because since 2012 they haven't had a pay increase in terms of inflation adjustments uh so it uh, and we will depoliticize the public service but the free first government has heavily politicized the public service if we will give independence to the public service commission and the public service commission must be comprised of people of repute who are apolitical and truly independent if if you uh... increase salaries and you looking at all these other initiatives or where will you get the money from you you did say about wastage are you thinking of taking away certain things to make up for these other things we have made provision in our budget every bit of our program here in this manifesto including is backed by a budget including uh, salary increases salary for yes. civil service yes, yes. Uh, you mean cost of living adjustment cost of living uh, actually uh, yes you know some people are receiving the same salaries today which they were receiving in 2012 how do you justify that you look at what salaries they are drawing what salary the prime minister is drawing you look at what salary the ministers are drawing the prime minister gets a thousand dollars a day roughly salary when he goes overseas he takes 3000 dollars a day how do they justify that what will you do Of course as far as the prime minister is no, we've, we've got to come down we've got to come down to earth. no i'm asking you what will you do as far as the salaries and, and, and have you have you have you got a a percentage of decrease that you're looking at well i cannot say that uh, what it will be but it will be substantial when i was prime minister i was getting about 80000 a year with allowances and all that added it probably came up to 120000 current prime minister is getting three times as much right from all that so if uh, when they talk about what the economy can sustain what it can't sustain do we have a do they have a sense of relativity 
Do they relate to the people on the ground? I am getting thousand dollars a day. This guy is getting four dollars a day on basic minimum. Uh, four dollars an hour, rather. You know. So uh, suddenly, uh, the pays that they have fixed for themselves in the past emoluments of uh, ministers and parliamentarians used to be fixed by an independent committee, parliamentary emoluments committee. And we'll bring that back so that uh, people of repute outside who have uh, no interest in the, um, in the matter determine the emoluments uh, of uh, MPs. Mr. Choudhury, how many seats are you targeting to get in this election? Well, Vijay, we're looking at 28. We've got to aim high. Do you believe you have the candidates to do the job? A lot to be done here based on what you, you're saying you'll do? Indeed, but you know, uh, it, 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 it is our vision uh, and uh, I think they're workable. Uh, what we need is uh, the political will to do it. And uh, Labour has always been considered as an underdog. In 87, they didn't think that we'll unseat Alliance. The party was only 17 months old then. It unseated a party which had been in power for 17 years. In 99, nobody gave us a uh, chance. No, definitely not. They were all saying that Reddy and Rambuka will win the elections. But the people thought otherwise. So, we'll give it our best shot and hope, and hope for the best. And I think the country needs a Labour government. We've tried all these other governments. My 12 months of record in government as Prime Minister is not matched by any of these people. I'm not boasting about it, but you ask the people who were there. In terms of financial management, in terms of legislative program, in terms of the reforms we brought in, in terms of people's issues, they, they haven't been able to match it. They haven't. The country needs the Labour Party. That's the only party which can turn around things here. We've seen all these people. Mr. Choudhury, if we do come into this situation where we do not reach 28 seats for any parties, of course, negotiations will be held. Yeah. Which parties can you work with? Can you work with the Fiji first? Definitely not. No go at all? No go. What about the People's Alliance and NFP? We can come to uh, agreement. Well, let's look at uh, what the results show and then we will be, there has to be a government in the country. So we'll have to accommodate each other and have a government that will serve the people. So the country needs you, politicians who are honest, who are committed and who are willing to work for the country, not for themselves or their, or their private interests. So you are willing to work with Mr. Rambuka and Professor Biman Prasad if the need arises? If the need arises to have a government in, the, in place, yes. But Mr. Navoka, the Sudelpa? Yes, if the need arises. I, I, we were going into this with an open mind. If we come to a situation where there is a need to uh, have a government, uh, which will be a multi-party government, because there is no other alternative, minus Fiji first, yes. So everyone except Fiji first? Yes. Reason? Pardon? Can you tell the people why? Why? Because as I said, if we come to a situation like that, the country must have a government. The reason is that, the, the, that please, we put Fiji first aside, save the country. We must cooperate for the sake of the people. We can't then take a hard position there and, 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 and uh, create further mess. So we've got to uh, be accommodative in such a situation and hope for the best. Mr. Choudhury, thank you very much for accepting our invitation tonight and speaking to the people about your policies, about uh, what you've been through and your plans going into the elections with three weeks away, November, uh, December 14th, when people go to vote. Tomorrow night, we've got... Uh, the deputy leader of uh, We Unite Fiji Party, Dr. Chone Hawea, he'll be here at 7 p.m. tomorrow. Uh, we have uh, continued to uh, check on the Fiji First, who are yet to confirm 
uh, their appearance on this show. Uh, we are waiting for them. Uh, we've got a slot open for them for this Thursday and I will be giving you information uh, and you will see our platforms if that comes through. Uh, next week, of course, Wednesday 30th November, uh, there's a debate on the economy and issues surrounding that. Uh, we have sent invites to, uh, for Minister for Economy, Ayah Said Kayum, to appear. Uh, Professor Biman Prasad uh, has been invited. Uh, Savinada Narumbe from U Unity Fiji. Manoa Kamikamida from People's Alliance. Uh, Mr. Mahendra Choudhury has been invited for that as well and a Sodelpa representative they are yet to confirm. Uh, on Wednesday, 7th December, uh, we, on rather Tuesday, 6th December, we have uh, a panel discussion with the women candidates uh, of different parties and on the 8th of December, a panel discussion with the younger candidates, the youth candidates. And then we round off uh, at 7 p.m. on Sunday, 11th December, a leaders debate uh, Mr. Rambuka has confirmed for that, uh, Professor Biman Prasad has confirmed for that, uh, Mr. Narumbe has confirmed for that, Mr. Ngavoka has confirmed for that, Mr. Choudhury has confirmed for that tonight. So that's the five leaders confirmed. We are awaiting the Fiji First leader, Vorenge Banimarava's confirmation. Stay with us. We'll be back tomorrow at 7 p.m. Have a good evening. What I did in 2006 is to clean up the mess in the study. When there has been it's okay leadership, everybody has been embraced. He cannot stomach the fact that he's not in government. You said that you couldn't pay out bonuses, but this shows an increase in board directors' fees. For any you, US, you are wanting to lead the country, not me. For any, I'm asking you the question again, back to corporal punishment. Right. What's your stand on it? TGFIRST cannot intervene into a personal matter. Absolutely you can for small you businesses. Can't. I was very uh, surprised when he came out with that statement that I would conduct a coup if I lose. Not Hand me. on your heart. It's him. No, you're a joke. Uh, no, you're a joke. You're a joke. You're a joke. You're a joke. Don't bring that up. You don't. No, no, I gotta bring it up. You were commander. But yes, every but military officer and serviceman at the time was under your command. forgotten you trade them. Bulovinaka, this is Fiji Village Street Talk. I'm VJ Narayan. VG Village Trade Talk with VJ Narayan, sponsored by Salt and Pepper Home Decor, living in high quality. Watch it live on the Fiji Village Facebook page. Download the all new Fiji Village app. Get the latest news direct to your mobile. Get the latest sports updates from our scoreboards online. Navigate easily through our categories. Watch videos from Straight Talk interviews, local music videos, sports and many more. You can now easily listen to your favorite radio stations from your phone. Download the all-new Fiji Village app right now.